Hello and welcome, it's Francis here. Thank you for coming back to my channel. If this is your first time here, I bid you welcome. There is a subscribe button below if you would like to help support this channel by subscribing and also a bell if you would like to be notified as to when I upload more content. I'm coming to you from Ghana country and as such, I acknowledge the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains as being the traditional custodians of this land and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So this video, I'm sort of doing it on the fly. It wasn't one that I was intending to do, but it sort of emerged out of an event that I participated in over the weekend, which was around Spring Equinox here in the Southern Hemisphere. And I was part of the panel. And before that event, we were all sent questions some of them to be shared amongst the group and some individually and i said due for two various reasons unfortunately um not all the questions were asked and in fact i was only asked one question directly to me so i thought i'll put this video together just in case anybody's remotely interested in my answers to the other questions that I had some thought into it. Well, I thought perhaps it's maybe my question, my answers were just so boring. I don't know. Anyway, um, I just thought I would start by sharing uh, extract to the sensitive plant, which is a poem by Percy Bashi Shelley. And the spring arose on the garden fair, but the spirit of love felt everywhere and each wild flower and herb on earth's dark grass rose from the dreams of its wintry rest. The snowdrop and then the violet arose from the ground with the warm wet rain wet, and their breath was mixed with sweet odour scent from the turf, like the voice and the instrument. And I have that in my book, shameless plug, that's in the sacred well. So the first question that Hannah was asked, and we did get this asked to us, was um, whether we could share some hands-on pragmatic practice or ritual specifically designed for the spring equinox that was relevant to our own spiritual path. Now, and I didn't also mention this, that being an initiate of a contemporary witchcraft tradition, we have specific rituals within our book of shadows and these follow the will of the year and also the sacred mythos that's contained within each of these eight portals some aspects can be adapted or have been adapted where the es essence of i suppose the sabbath of the season can be shared with non-initiates and um, that's something that i've been doing for a while so, and also I like writing rituals anyway, so I sort of like adding stuff to what was a basic framework. But to me, the overarching theme of the spring equinox is one of balance. After all, it is a time where the hours of daylight and night allegedly are supposed to be equal. There was a little bit of debate about that, but yeah, it's this these two pivotal points in the year where we have this balance. And as Hermes Magistus said, as above, so below, as within, so without. But taking on board that what's happening in the cosmos happens here on Earth. And also what's within ourselves is reflected outwards. So this is all sort of bringing into that balance into our own lives, looking at the balance in our own lives and all aspects, magical and mundane, work, life, work and social life, work and family, how much time do we give to other people as opposed to how much time do we give to ourselves? How much downtime do we give? Are we rushing around after everybody else? I suppose for me in particular, it's just how much time do I give to my spiritual practice? So in Sure, the spring equinox is this balance, this sort of scales, and asking us to sort of weigh 
our obligations. It's also interesting that it comes as the midpoint between, say, the winter solstice, where we start planting the seeds or thinking about the seeds that we want to plant, things that we want to achieve in our life, and also the summer solstice where we we're beginning to sort of like reap in the bounty. So being a bit of a gardener myself, this is the time where you start to sort of like pull out the weeds, maybe thin out the carrots, um, sort of making sure, sort of sorting out what seeds are beneficial and things that you're still going to continue with, which is still on the crack, what things need a little bit more push, a little bit more energy, and what things could maybe be putting them in the too hard basket or be delayed to next year. So that was my answer to the first question. The second question was, as practical practitioners, we know that hands-on work is invaluable. And um, so each of us was to delve into a specific ritual, craft, or hands-on practice that we personally use to celebrate the spread of knots. And how do these practices exemplify our magical path and why? So my answer to this is that hands-on work, regardless of what it is, builds up your confidence in your magic, in your craft. It also helps bringing you to a deeper level of understanding, especially with these changing energies where you reside in the land, uh, what's happening around you, even quiet observation. One of the panelists was talking about the bees and sort of like noticing the be a bit more consciously aware of, say, the bees that are beginning to come out to pollinate the plant flowers. Also, because we get very extreme temperatures here, making sure that they've got enough water to drink. Um, again, this sort of comes in to this balance aspect that I just mentioned earlier. It also helps you connect with the land, especially these days when a lot of our social media feeds are filled with Northern Hemisphere-centric information. And if you live in the Southern Hemisphere, it could be a little bit daunting or confusing. So that sort of brings us back to our sense of place, a sense of connection. And when we start observing nature, we then also realise that there is a imperfection that's perfectly demonstrated within nature. And hopefully that sort of like transitions us away from this perfection, this facade that we have due to social media, in particular Instagram, where everything needs to be perfect. Nature isn't perfect, yet it is. It works perfectly. I said there's this perfection within the imperfect. And again, by doing something by hand, whether it's crafting something out of clay or tying two pieces of wood together or branches together or a couple of branches together to make say a pentagram shape or whatever crafting you only improve through the practice however even the most wonkiest say clay shaped bowl I was thinking of some of my first pottery that I threw which is how bizarre that they are and I still have them because again it flicks my interpretation reflects my understanding and the bowl itself I think it was a hand coiled bowl there were pieces in it where the clay was thick there's other places in it where the clay was thin I still use it as a sensor as somewhere something to put um, especially if, if I'm burning sage I'm supposed to say that um, I have a sage bush um, or palisanto sticks or I, I use this bowl that I made when I first started throwing pots as part of my ritual implements. So to me, crafting magic needs to be grounded. It needs to be grounded in this practicality. It needs to be grounded in the mundane as well. So if we're participating in a ritual, say about balance, then it also needs to reflect what's happening in our everyday life, not having this separation between one or the other. Then the next question that we were going to be asked was, what are some simple yet powerful ways one can harness the energy of the spring in every day? To me, 
that would be the observance of the natural world around you. Mother Nature is the greatest teacher. She's also the greatest healer. In our modern world, I don't. it doesn't matter if we are magical or not. We tend to spend too much time locked away inside. Most of us are connected on our screens, whether it's laptops, computers, iPhones, iPads, whatever. We are rushing from one appointment to another and we don't have this time to connect or to purposely connect. Also, you know, here in Australia, a lot of our houses are air-conditioned, cars are air-conditioned, our work environments are air-conditioned. So again, we are cut off from this natural ebb and flow of energies. And I think we're seeing this how me, my uneducated opinions is that this disconnect that's occurring, even the simple of walking on the ground without bare feet, not doing that anymore. Well, there's probably no green spaces left because it's all covered up in asphalt or concrete. But this disconnect is beginning to affect us and our mental health. We are still human beings. We do need to connect with Mother Nature. And I think it's actually been scientifically proven that walking barefoot on the grass, on the ground, actually gives us that grounding ability, that sort of clearing out of our headspace. So then we can actually concentrate and operate a little bit better in our extremely busy lives. Uh, the next question, so maybe this, there were so many questions here, but I wonder if we didn't get through them. How do each of us, I said there were five people, incorporate the energies of the spring equinox into our magical practice? And again, to me, this is all about balance, um, the hermetic principle, up as above, so below, as within, so without. Looking at our external world, seeing how that's reflected in our internal world and vice versa. Again, this connection, to me at least, is very important. And then the last joint question was, how can you share a ritual or practice that is specifically meaningful for you during the spring equinox? Again, finds all about balance. And I was going to plug my book a little bit, saying actually in Dancing the Sacred Wheel, my chapter six, which is all about the spring equinox, I do mention about how to construct a labyrinth. And you could do this in the backyard, you could do it on a sheet, or a couple of sheets, sew them together and draw it out. And as you walk around the labyrinth into the circle and come out again, contemplate about balance in your life. I also have a tree meditation in here, which is really good about grounding. So getting away from this headspace that we tend to live in our heads and grounding it out as well. And then don't forget spring cleaning. Um, the simple act of clearing out your wardrobe, your cupboards, that might not seem magical on the surface. Again, you are releasing in order to make room or space for the seeds that maybe you planted and in milk or this winter solstice to come into your life. Then we moved on to the questions that each of us were going to be asked and mine was to share a practical application of connecting with deity that aligns with the energies of the spring equinox. My practice in particular, especially my personal practice, a lot of that is through meditation, observance, even use the use of mantra. That's why I don't have it on. I usually have a mala. Um, the repetition of sacred prayer, sacred words. That helps, again, getting out of the headspace. Walking the labyrinth also helps you to sort of ground focus on one point um, when it comes to connecting with deity specifically with deity 
That's a really good question because I have always been religious and deity has always found their way to me. I mean, to big note myself, but I wouldn't say I'm a channel, but I'm almost like a catalyst. Uh, maybe I'm just easily contactable up there in the God's realms. I don't know. Um, I do find, and I actually did mention this too, that I recently listened to a podcast where someone said was talking about offerings. That when you go to sacred sites these days, people aren't making offerings or enough offerings or the type of offerings that they are making often come from the earth but don't actually come from us. And what the person who was talking about this actually meant is that when you think about it, an offering from our own selves probably means a lot more to deity, to spirit, to a sacred place, however you want to um, view this, than something that you've actually taken from Mother Earth. If you've gone to a sacred tree, for example, and you've got a piece of rock that's been blasted out of a mine in Brazil, is that appropriate? Does that have that connection? Instead, why not use your breath? Something of you, sing, chant, even sacred prayer, a heartfelt gesture, giving something of yourself. In some traditions, they even like put the finger, we use menstrual blood. Some people use saliva or some people use sexual fluids. Again, these are all forms of offerings that can help you connect with deity, depending on what sort of deity it is. Some deities do like wine or grain or something that you've got. But I've also found that something that I have specifically made, going back to the crafting aspect, doesn't matter how wonky it is, when you make it with purpose, when you make it with intention, it's your energy, your essence that you put into it, that deity that the other is going to connect in with. And I think I mentioned other things, but I can't recall what I said. Then I was supposed to be asked, how do I incorporate the elements of spring in gardening and green magic? Now, this is a question that I really don't know why it was directed at me because I don't really know what was classified as green magic these days. Yes, I have a garden. Um, it's full of weeds at the moment. But um, some of the elements of the spring equinox that maybe are reflected in my garden, especially here in Adelaide, is that there's a bit of a blend between traditional spring with the budding of the fruit trees and the spring flowers. But there's also an element more nutritionally associated with Beltane because there's also the promise of early abundance. It's almost like an, an urgency to get things done because I can't remember the last time we actually had rain a couple of weeks ago. Where I live, it's very clay soil and it dries up very quickly. So you have a very minute opportunity to pull out the weeds, which someone told me a number of years ago. I just plants that no one's found a use for. Um, here in Adelaide, we don't tend to have the traditional eight distinctive Sabbaths. A couple sort of blur into each other. So again, coming back to um, the concept of being observant, there, within Aboriginal culture, there is a concept, and I hope I'm pronouncing this correct, called Dadidi, Dadidi, which basically means inner deep listening or quiet still awareness. Similar to contemplation, we go out into your garden, onto your sacred space, it could be to the local park, and just be and listen and open yourself up. And I suppose in a way this could be connected with the earlier question about connecting to deity. Is that when we recognize that we have this deep well of deep listening, of awareness within us, then it sort of extends out there where we realize that each one of us is a vital part of the whole. And within the shamanic teachings, 
that I understand, they talk a lot about the cosmic web. This understanding that we're not separated from it, even though our modern world is very individualistic and likes to think that, you know, I just do things in my little box and it doesn't affect anybody else. Where, of course, in essence, we are all interconnected. This tapping into this sort of deep well of awareness, deep knowing, slows us down as well. Especially with this headspace, and we're in a society where, you know, we talk about productivity and rush, rush, rush. But in doing that, we slow down. We are able to achieve things on a deeper level that actually mean more to us. We're able to see the results. We're actually to plot and see how things are transgressing. Instead of just snapping our fingers and expecting things to actually occur. And therefore true magic, according to me, is deep soul magic. And that's all about awareness. It's about sort of stepping through that veil into the mysteries. And realizing that things need to take their natural course of action. And uh, when I teach people, it's just like there's two cycles that we have. We have the lunar cycle, and a lot of people are very aware of the lunar cycle. But then the wheel of the year, Sabbaths, is a bigger cycle, but it's for longer term goals. And this practice of deep listening, of Dadidi. At the spring equinox seems very appropriate because we're bringing all about that balance. And then the conference was to, or the panel was supposed to wrap up with, I think, three more questions for everybody. First one being, what's one piece of practical advice you'll give to somebody who is looking to make the most of the spring equinox? One would be to get out in nature, to meditate, and to consider what balance means to you. After all, that's the theme of the spring equinox. It's all about balance. The next question, what advice would you give to beginners looking to establish their own spring equinox traditions? I would say don't rush to throw the baby out with bath water. I think it is very important to familiarise yourself with the traditional aspect the folkloric aspect, okay, we're not in England or the Northern Hemisphere, but there is sort of a background to why, to the myths, to the folklore. If you are on country where you know the local myths, the local folklore, the local story, research them, sit with the people, ask the questions. And then see what elements actually reflect where you reside. And again, what I did with my book was incorporate the history or the traditional lens of the Sabbath and then looked out into the environment where I'm residing on and seeing, okay, that reflects, that doesn't. As I said earlier, the Sabbaths are here, especially in Adelaide, there's a few that sort of blend or sort of merge together. There's some that oh, so it sort of reflects the Aboriginal seasonal wheel in some parts of the country where not everything is eight sections. Some of them, or four sections, some of them may last a couple of weeks, some of them may last a couple of months, all different sizes, and depending on where you are in the country, you, know, you could go from two seasons to ten. So it all depends about observing your environment and the last question was what resources would you recommend for someone who wanted to delve deeper into the practices i read a book about it um my book's based for the southern hemisphere okay it is contemporary witchcraft lens that's the lens that i look out of um so it will uh, I would say be a good starting point. There are other books out there. Um, Roxanne Boswell. Boswell. Um, sorry, Roxanne, if you're watching this. Uh, wrote Sunrise. It's probably one of the first Australian books that I came across. It's still published today. Um, in 
New Zealand Judy Judy R. Barton has a book. And I think these days, well, I'd like to think these days, that there are other books out there as well, specifically for the Southern Hemisphere. If you reside in the Southern Hemisphere, I think each, I know my book is, I sort of have sort of cast the lens wide, but at the end of the day, I can only write from the area that I know, and that's here in Adelaide and also my part of South Australia. But it can be used as a, a foundation or a, a, an introduction to finding your own part. So I think that's enough. Um, those are my answers to the questions that we didn't get asked. Um, I feel mildly interested. And uh, yeah, so happy equinox. It's a bit late now. And we begin to move on to. Paltain here in the Southern Hemisphere. Blessings. <laughs>